A new idea is a delicate creature. It can be killed by a sneer or a yawn. It can be terminated by a frown on the right man's brow. That is why it is so hard for new ideas to be born in our world. Like turtles, they get eliminated even before they reach the ocean of collective mind. One of the alchemical truths is that there is no organic or non-organic matter. These are our interpretations and linguistic definitions. Everything that is, it is life. The world is the imagined perpetual mobile, making everything from nothing. But somehow the wheel was invented, or to say more accurately, the pattern of cyclical nature was translated by man into matter. After the great invention of the wheel for centuries onward, man has tried to make it turn forever. Every other curious scientist would take the grand concept of perpetual mobile and make free energy engine his life goal. One day, man will connect his apparatus to the very wheelwork of the universe, and the very forces that motivate the planets in their orbits, and cause them to rotate will rotate his own machinery," wrote Nikola Tesla in his diaries. A perpetual motion machine is a hypothetical machine that can work indefinitely without an external energy source. The machines that extract energy from finite sources cannot operate indefinitely because they are driven by the energy stored in the source, which obviously will be exhausted. Even devices powered by ocean currents whose energy is ultimately derived from the sun, will eventually burn out. And yet, everybody was obsessed with creating a perfect isolated system. Oh, ye seekers after perpetual motion, how many vain chimeras have you pursued? Go and take your place with the alchemists, wrote Leonardo da Vinci, who also put several years of his life on this task. Most of these guys were trying to create an engine, and that's why it failed each time. Inventors sought a mechanism that could produce energy rather than a structure that could recirculate energy without loss. The classic designs, wheels weighted unevenly, magnets chasing each other, fluids cycling between chambers, all relied on the idea that one could extract more work than the system contained. This pursuit built machines that attempted to win against friction, gravity, and entropy. But these forces are not enemies as man usually assume in this man's world. They are the rhythm section of movement. When the machine treats them as opposition, it loses access to the field that sustains motion. Nature's self-sustaining systems never operate in isolation. A heart keeps beating because oxygen flows through it. A planet keeps orbiting because it moves within a gravitational curve. A cell keeps breathing because it exchanges with its environment. Every infinite system functions as open recursion. The perpetual motion inventors sealed their machines to keep energy inside and thereby killed the very circulation that defines life. The dream of a self-sustaining wheel or fountain reminds us of the search for a material analog of the unmoved mover, a system that perpetually acts without external input, an embodiment of absolute self-sufficiency. Aristotle observed that everything in the universe is in motion, planets, elements, life, thought, but if every movement requires a prior cause, the chain could never start. To avoid infinite regress, he postulated the unmoved mover, a source of motion that itself is not moved by anything else. This entity is pure actuality without potentiality, meaning it is fully realized, complete and self-sufficient. Movement, as Aristotle saw, implies potential seeking actualization. A seed becomes a tree, a thought becomes an act, a desire becomes a motion. Every motion therefore aims at something, an end, a form. But if every mover is itself moved by something prior, the chain would extend infinitely, leaving motion without source. Hence, he posited the unmoved mover that which moves everything by final attraction, it draws all things toward itself as their fulfillment, while itself never leaving its own state of completeness. This brings us to the idea that the essence of movement lies not in what causes it to start, but in what calls it to finish. It reverses the temporal arrow of causality, where the future governs the motion of things and not the past. The sculptor's hand moves, 
because the image of the finished statue already exists in his imagination. That image is the final cause that draws the material process toward its form. In psychological life, longing functions the same way. Desire pulls the soul toward its object, even though that object may never have existed in physical form. The unmoved mover is some sort of ontological stillness, the perfect actuality that makes becoming possible. To avoid falling into a trap of absolute origin, let's fixate on understanding the system. A system is an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. If you look at that definition closely for a minute, you can see that a system must consist of three kinds of things. Elements, interconnections, and a function or purpose. For example, the elements of your digestive system include teeth, enzymes, stomach, and intestines. They are interrelated through the physical flow of food and through an elegant set of regulating chemical signals. The function of this system is to break down food into its basic nutrients and to transfer those nutrients into the bloodstream, another system, while discarding unusable wastes. A football team is a system with elements such as players, coach, field and ball. Its interconnections are the rules of the game, the coach's strategy, the players' communications, and the laws of physics that govern the motions of the ball and players. The purpose of the team is to win games, or have fun, or get exercise, or make millions of dollars, or all of the above. A school is a system, so is a city and a factory and a corporation and a national economy. An animal is a system, a tree is a system, and a forest is a larger system that encompasses subsystems of trees and animals. The Earth is a system, so is the solar system, so is a galaxy. Systems can be embedded in systems which are embedded in yet other systems. Is there anything that is not a system? Yes, a conglomeration without any particular interconnections or function. Sand scattered on a road by happenstance is not itself a system. You can add sand or take away sand, and you still have just sand on the road. Arbitrarily add or take away football players or pieces of your digestive system, and you quickly no longer have the same system. When a living creature dies, it loses its systemness. The multiple interrelations that held it together no longer function, and it dissipates, although its material remains part of a larger food web system. Some people say that an old city neighborhood where people know each other and communicate regularly is a social system, and that a new apartment block full of strangers is not, not until new relationships arise and a system forms. You can see from these examples that there is an integrity or wholeness about a system and an active set of mechanisms to maintain that integrity. Systems can change, adapt, respond to events, seek goals, mend injuries, and attend to their own survival in lifelike ways, although they may contain or consist of non-living things. Systems can be self-organizing and often are self-repairing over at least some range of disruptions. They are resilient and many of them are evolutionary. Out of one system, other completely new, never before imagined systems can arise. The story of the blind man and the elephant is a parable about a group of blind men who touch an elephant to understand it for the first time. Each man feels a different part of the elephant and comes to a wildly different conclusion, leading to a heated argument because their limited subjective experiences conflict. This story is often told to teach a simple lesson, but one that we often ignore. The behavior of a system cannot be known just by knowing the elements of which the system is made. You think that because you understand one, that you must therefore understand two, because one and one make two. But you forget that you must also understand and. The elements of a system are often the easiest parts to notice, because many of them are visible, tangible things. The elements that make up a tree are roots, trunk, branches, and leaves. If you look more closely, you see specialized cells, vessels carrying fluids up and down, chloroplasts, and so on. You can divide elements into sub-elements and then sub-sub-elements. Pretty soon, you lose sight of the system. As the saying goes, 
you can't see the forest for the trees. Before going too far in that direction, it's a good idea to stop dissecting out elements and to start looking for the interconnections, the relationships that hold the elements together. The interconnections in the tree system are the physical flows and chemical reactions that govern the tree's metabolic processes. The signals that allow one part to respond to what is happening in another part. For example, as the leaves lose water on a sunny day, a drop in pressure in the water-carrying vessels allows the roots to take in more water. Conversely, if the roots experience dry soil, the loss of water pressure signals the leaves to close their pores, so as not to lose even more precious water. As the days get shorter in the temperate zones, the deciduous tree puts forth chemical messages that cause nutrients to migrate out of the leaves into the trunk and roots, and that weaken the stems, allowing the leaves to fall. There even seem to be messages that cause some trees to make repellent chemicals or harder cell walls if just one part of the plant is attacked by insects. No one understands all the relationships that allow a tree to do what it does. That lack of knowledge is not surprising. It's easier to learn about a system's elements than about its interconnections. Systems can be nested within systems, therefore there can be purposes within purposes. Element and interconnection remains the same. To ask whether elements, interconnections, or purposes are most important in a system is to ask an unsystemic question. All are essential. All interact. All have their roles. But the most fun ones are the systems that snowball. When a system has a reinforcing feedback loop, it enhances whatever direction of change is imposed on it. For example, when we were kids, the more my brother pushed me, the more I pushed him back. So, the more he pushed me back, the more I pushed him back. The more prices go up, the more wages have to go up. If people are to maintain their standards of living, the more wages go up, the more prices have to go up to maintain profits. This means that wages have to go up again. So, prices go up again. The more soil is eroded from the land, the less plants are able to grow. So the fewer roots there are to hold the soil, so the more soil is eroded, so less plants can grow. Anyway, you get the point. Reinforcing loops are found wherever a system element has the ability to reproduce itself or to grow as a constant fraction of itself. Watch out. If you see feedback loops everywhere, you're already in danger of becoming a systems thinker. Instead of seeing only how A causes B, you'll begin to wonder how B may also influence A, and how A might reinforce or reverse itself. You'll be thinking not in terms of a static world, but a dynamic one. You'll stop looking for who's to blame. Instead, you'll start asking, what's the system? The concept of feedback opens up the idea that a system can cause its own behavior. A system is entirely self-sustaining when it no longer requires anything from outside itself to continue its operation. In classical mechanics, this seems impossible Energy dissipates, friction exists, entropy accumulates. But at a conceptual level, perpetual self-sufficiency is about the organization of processes such that each component generates or regenerates the next. It's the archetype of autopoiesis, the way living systems maintain themselves. The cell consumes nutrients, repairs itself, produces the enzymes needed for metabolism, and reproduces components for continuity. No external hand is strictly necessary. Systems' internal dynamics close the loop. The beauty of ecosystems is endless. No single organism manages the forest. Yet nutrient cycles, predator-prey dynamics, and plant succession create a resilient, self-sustaining whole. Each element responds to local conditions, soil quality, sunlight, predation. But together, they produce macro-level patterns that maintain balance. The forest has no ruler, but every element follows consistent rules of growth, consumption, and decay. Classical assumption is that order requires a designer, a conscious architect. Philosophically, the ecosystem situates us in a universe where structure, stability, and creativity emerge spontaneously, rather than being imposed. This is the essence of emergent order. Complex adaptive behavior arises from the interaction of simple rules at a local level, producing coherent patterns at a higher level. The universe doesn't need an external agent to hold it together. 
the interactions themselves are sufficient to generate intelligible patterns. It reframes causality. Instead of linear, top-down control, we perceive distributed causation, where no single element governs the whole, yet the whole expresses intelligible regularity. No central intelligence implies that meaning emerges through relationships. This points to a universe where autonomy and interdependence coexist. Everything follows its nature, and the collective behavior manifests emergent harmony. If we sacrifice the utilitarian aspect of perpetual motion machines, we will find that such motion is very much possible. In the next video, we will go into the topic of endless knots.